Are you ready to get woke? Welcome to the Woke as F*** podcast with your host, Alex Lazarev. All right. Starring the Woke as F*** podcast with a little sexual awkwardness. Touched my knee there. Two men touching each other. But we're very comfortable. Yeah. No, we're very com- Hey, listen. He was there with Osho during that whole period of craziness. Not just spiritual craziness. Uh, lots of heart opening. Lots of sexuality. I mean, a lot of crazy things were happening. We'll be hearing about that, won't we? Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm going to let you uh, guide the whole conversation. Right. You point me in the right direction, and I'm going to start with uh, saying that uh, an ancient saying that any friend of yours is a friend of mine. So I'm very happy to share with the people in your life. Beautiful. I thought you were going to go mafia style. Hey, <laughs> friend of yours is a friend of ours, you know? Um, so first, a confession. I, I messed up today. I was so excited and uh, I left my second mic, so we're going to be going back to the old days where we were sharing one. But it's okay. Don't panic. It'll force me to shut up and not interrupt, so it's, it, it probably should be all right. Ooh, it's going to be tough on me, too, but I'll, I'll go with it. We'll, we'll make it. So, today, I'm very excited. There's a lot of really cool people down in Vilcabamba, Ecuador, where I live part of the year. Fascinating people. And, uh, and this gentleman here, well, he's been on the path for a long time. And uh, and he's 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 just very super chill. He he's into massage and healing, and his his touch is amazing. I just had one of his massages, and it's it's like it's nothing like you've ever had before. You're just there, and it's like he's talking to your body through magic. And that'll be one of the things we'll talk about because that's that that's fascinating. Your your abilities as a masseuse, but also you were he he was also uh, with Osho. He was, you were actually Osho's personal masseuse for quite some time, and that's how often do you get to talk to somebody who was with you know, freaking Osho. That's awesome. So definitely some of the things we want to we want to cover. Uh, but let's start at the beginning. Let's start at the beginning. Who were you before? Because question number two is going to be, how did you get into the whole spiritual awakening and all that kind of stuff? But before all that, what, who were you? What was life like? What were you all about? So I was born in California back in, uh, back in the early 50s. And so I grew up Great time to be in California, amazing uh, time before the population explosion. And uh, so I grew up, I was born on the beach, I grew up near the water. Uh, I was, my, I gravitated, my main love was sports, was the body. It's always been the body, I'll, I'll talk more about that as we go along. But I've always loved what happens when you come into the moment with the body especially at the beach or I, I became a semi-professional athlete. I was on a basketball scholarship to the University of San Diego and that's when I started seeing uh, touch used because we all got injuries. So when you would be injured, you would go to the trainer and then he would do stuff and we had a kind of a roly-poly fat guy, you know, because it was mostly black people, uh, and he was a black trainer, Willie Moore, and he one time did something when my hip was out. He just did a little movement on it, and, and I before I was like, really, oh, man, I'm like, in, and he did a little maneuver, and I was like, it, it disappeared. So this left an imprint, and so then the sports, my last year in university, I found out about yoga and I have to say that you mentioned when did my search begin it maybe started a little before because I had a few mystical moments with sports when you know this about second wind or when you get into a zone it's just like so beyond mind so I had a few of those but then when I got into yoga, I'm like, my God, yoga, th this is, and I even told my uh, coach who became a very famous NBA coach, I said, believe me, Bernie, everybody's going to be doing yoga at some point. All the athletes will be doing yoga. And so uh, from that point on, that led me to a demonstration about, because I had never had a teacher, I learned on my own. And uh, I did it every day for a couple years. And then I saw a poster for a, a demonstration about yoga with a Swami Pujari. 
And I thought, oh, this is cool. I'm going to meet an Indian. This was back in like 75, so a long time ago. And uh, so, but already yoga was in, you know, because of the Beatles, because of George Harrison, Woodstock. There was even uh, a yogi at Woodstock. So it was kind of in my brain as something exotic and interesting. So when I started, I, I did it every day, and then, but I'd never had a teacher or a, I'd never met any Indians. And so I go, and I think it's going to be this, and this Swami Satya Pujari was tall, red-headed guy with a mala of Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, who became known as Osho. And he's like a few years older than me, but he's been to India and uh, so he talked about his spiritual master, Osho. And on the board, his theme for the day is acceptance is transcendence. Those three words. And those three words, I have to say, they started me on a journey that's never ended. It, it, it was the beginning. And, and then very quick after that, I, I became a full-time student with Pujari. I became a teacher at his yoga institute. We started doing the dynamic meditations of Osho. Uh, I started listening, and I said, I've got to go to India. So that's kind of how it all started. So how did you actually... So so basically up until that point... Um, so I, I'm 24. I'm 23, 24 at this point. Okay, so you're 24. All right, good. So you were in minus quite a significant number there. Um so what was your kind of what was your life plan before you got into the yoga and discovered Osho and all this kind of stuff? What what was your idea of what your life was going to be like? What was your what was your plan? What was was there a plan? Yeah, the plan was become uh, independently wealthy, retire by age thirty, and uh, so I was in a real estate company side by side that was selling land outside of L.A. So I'm like full time on that. And by the way, I just want to digress. Both of these came into my life at the same time, real estate and yoga. And I started doing yoga every day. And I said, if the real estate business, because I, I don't think this is the place, but that, that's a huge story. This real estate, it was based on psycho-cybernetics. It was based on Think and Grow Rich. It was based on all the great pioneers of you create your own life through how you think. Uh, so, but I made a pledge inside myself if I said, if the business gets too busy, that I do not have an hour a day for myself, I'm dropping the business. And, uh, and I kept that pledge. And then maybe two years le later, I meet Pujari, the, the Osho Sannyasin. And by that time, me and my best friend, my older brother, and a couple really hotshot salesmen, we broke off from the original company, started our own company, and we were we were on the fast track. We were at, at that, like I said, I'm only 20. I started the business at 21, but by 24, we all owned property. We all, you know, had nice cars. And so I had, and, and the only reason I wanted to be rich is so I would have time for me. I didn't have any, like, okay, of course I like nice things, but, but it was more like, I don't want to work for somebody. I, I want to be independent. I want to have my own life. I, I want to do the things around the body because that was my main thing. But I, at that point, I said, how am I going to make money with my love of sports? I'm not good enough to be a pro athlete. I'm good, but I'm not that good. So how am I going to make, you know, I don't want to be a coach a teacher in the school system i loved physiotherapy but i already saw that you know if you're a physiotherapist you're just plugged into the system i at a very early age i don't know why i didn't want to be part of the main i think that's why osho just made so much sense to me right away. there was never a doubt like this guy knows what's happening and uh, if i and, and i didn't know how even it was the I mean, you're a little younger, but a, a lot of us, this was the, the golden age of the hippies, the early 70s, and we were thinking out of the box, but 
one by one, people were getting pulled into the system. And I said, wow. I didn't think so consciously, but it was always there. How am I going to keep from getting pulled down? Like, even my good friends are like compromising their working jobs they don't like. I don't want to do that. So then when I went to India and in the Yoga Institute in San Diego, it was in San Diego, best place I've ever seen. In, in 40 years, I've never seen it improved upon, 45 years now. A great center. Pujari, by the way, is so into his own self-realization. He disappeared off the map, and you can't even find him on anywhere. And And this guy is really, really what I would call an enlightened being on the planet. But so anyway, the real estate happened, and then at the yoga place, Osho people were coming in. So this guy, an American Jew from uh, Boston, really from a rich family, he comes and he meets me, and he says, I want to have a commune for Osho people. And I'm still not a sannyasin. I'm, I'm going to the Yoga Institute and I still have my old name. I'm not a, a disciple of Osho yet. I never met him. And and I tell Krishna Prem was his name. I said, I can show you a place tomorrow that you can have a commune. And so he said, what? I said, yeah, I'll drive you out there. And so it was three hours to get to uh, the high desert of uh, near Apple Valley in California. And I drove him to a guest ranch that I knew was for sale. It used to be like a place where kids would go for, you know, the weekend and stuff. And he saw it and he fell in love. It was 70 acres just up on the hill and uh, beautiful property. And so then he wanted to buy it. So this guy's really best talker I've ever been around. He, he's just really slick. So he talks me and biggest deal I've ever had up to that point, you know, really a big deal, great commission. He talks me into giving up my commission. He tries to get our company to give up the commission, but the other people in the company said, listen, dude, no way. We're not, you know, this is your story. But anyway, uh, he said, you can always live there. I said, okay, you know, my mind thought, okay, this, this is cool. And like you hinted at, when I went to that yoga uh, demonstration back, like I'm 23, I walk into a room expecting Hare Krishna type stuff or austere yoga. And the best looking women I'd seen, like they're all in orange because at that time Osho's people wore orange. They have malas and they're loose, you know, they're doing yoga, they're doing breathing exercises, they're into energy and and. That, to me, was just so new. And I had always had trouble with women that they weren't, you know, not that I had trouble getting close, but they weren't juicy the way I, like I never went for a lot of great makeup and the outer look. And these girls, they, they had it on the inside. And so I'm like saying, whoever the guy behind this is. <laughs> so I was kind of hooked for many reasons, like acceptance is transcendence is one thing, that's the spiritual. But when I saw, and then he's saying, uh, from sex you go to superconscious, I'm like, really? Really? This is interesting. And it, unless you go into your sexuality, you can't grow spiritually. I'm like, what? You know, I was raised Catholic, you know, I was raised, I had my friends, they could not go to sleep with, I had two friends, they got in so much trouble in early teenage time, they were told not to sleep with their hands under the blankets, you know why, of course, and uh, so that's the kind of guilt I was you know, it was loaded on me, you know, I, I got in trouble for holding hands at a football game when I was 14, some girl told the, the nun that we were doing this, and the nun said, you know, you're a, I would rather you spit on me than do this to Jesus. And, and we're all thinking, all of us, we're young guys, we're thinking, this is full of shit. But on the other hand, you're a little bit intimidated. And she was like, 
almost crying because we've hurt. And so I grew up with a lot of guilt around the body, even though I love the body. So that's, to me, what Osho should have got a Nobel Peace Prize. He, he said, you've got to love the body. You, you cannot bypass the body. And, and that got him into a lot of controversy. People called him the sex guru, and, and they shut off to him. He's all about sex. But when you go deeper into his message, he's not about sex at all. He's saying, just don't repress it. So I was hooked. I, I digress from the real estate. So then after the deal closed, we move on to the property. And right next to us, one ranch over, is a group. I don't know if you ever heard of this group, but it was amazing, called the Enlightenment Intensive. It, it, it's, it's an intensive where for three days you sit with a partner and I would say to you, tell me who you are. And then I would be quiet, and you would tell me who you are, you know. And you would start with, you know, I'm a man. I'm, you know, what you do. And, and it wasn't about that. It was who are you behind everything else. And so me, but I'm a little naive and innocent. I hear they called us and they said we need we have an odd number because you need an even number for the exit. And would anyone like to? come and do the enlightenment intensive and I'm like dude enlighten this sounds great don't we all want to get enlightened and uh, so I did it but it I have to say it was one of the most difficult weekends of my life because you start at five in the morning you go till 10 at night you don't eat much uh, you have to run up and down the mountain a couple times it was quite it's a great, and Osho used this intensive. This He used this uh, group in Pune. That was the first group he told me to do when I met him, Enlightenment Intensive. So anyway, after the, I, I did have a moment. It was really hard, but I had a breakthrough that for a minute I saw who I am behind what everybody sees, and I was like shocked and, and like like many story I couldn't kind of stop take the grin off my face I was laughing inside I was crying it was just like so beautiful and uh, and so then the Monday morning I'm like I, I get back and I say I'm going to India you know that's the only thing I and I didn't have the money to do it right away but I went home I got the money together, and I took off, uh, I think within a week, I was. I, I said, I got to meet Osho. And so that's a little bit. Of, and so I dropped the real estate at that point. And, uh, but I thought, okay, if I can live in this space that I've experienced, this is worth more than any money you can give me. And I'll solve the fine. I already knew enough that, and I had already started dabbling in, the healing arts, and and I had a very good, because of my athletic background, I, I've naturally had a good hand-eye coordination. So if you tell me, okay, do this, I, I'm pretty quick, and I have a lot of love for people. So those two things took me in that direction. I want to turn it back over to you, but before, there's one small distinction I want to make. To get for you to get to know me, I don't ever say I do massage, and I don't consider what me and Anasha share as massage. Uh, it, it's really, to me, it's nothing to do with massage. What I do, it's a touching meditation. I use the touch, and of course, some things you could recognize as massage, but but it's using the whole spectrum of human touch, even. Even the vibration of our voice is a touch. And that's why we call it conscious touch. I, I never call it massage. I, I don't say, okay, I'm going to give you a... I, I say, I'm going to meditate with you. And, and I use the touch to help the person see behind the body, behind the pains and pleasures, into the consciousness in the body. 
And so that just, the, and, and I wasn't Osho's masseur. I, I, he called me his touch-based doctor. Hmm. And so I did many things. That would take too long, but I, I was with him almost daily for nine months. And so many, beaut- to watch an enlightened man who was poisoned by the American government and had, he died very prematurely at the hands of uh, the U.S. government. Uh, to see him in pain and not be affected by it, it, it was transforming. That's, I, I still benefit from watching him because he had such a presence, such a, I mean, you would, I, I know you love hearing him tell jokes. I, I think it, it's really in the Guinness Book of World Records, he's told more jokes than almost anybody within his spiritual discourses. And he would say, you know, that's the religion has never had a sense of humor. That's why it cannot work. That was one of his very beautiful insights that got lost because of what happened in Oregon. This became the big thing. He's a, you know, an anarchist, or you know, we're poisoning people, and and none of this was uh, actually the way it was portrayed. As a real estate agent, I know the big problem was that we went in and tried to go over land use laws. And the American government, they had they had us on that. They had us. So everything we tried to do, they could bring it back to that we did not say. And that was a big mistake that we made from the beginning. So everything you saw on Netflix, and it's all true, but it only... It takes like if, if you have a big pie, it takes like one percent of the story, and it, it's very factual because it's uh, it's it's very well done. The guys from Netflix were great, but it doesn't tell anything of the story of who we were, the experiment we were actually doing to transform human energy into something really, really uh, heavenly. So anyway, that I just wanted to clarify. It's not massage. It's not... Uh, and uh, becoming independently wealthy, and not even wealthy, becoming independently creative. I would say that's more my deep longing. I, I want to be able to be creative in my way, and that's what we try to... Like we teach people how to do that through, through the body through meditation mm. very right. very good very good uh, speaking of spiritual jokes uh, I was just hanging out with a really uh, a good buddy um, in Vancouver and uh, he has his own joke he does an excellent Indian accent very good oh, I, and, he oh. just, he, and he just and he just he just goes okay uh, he just says okay I tell you a problem with white people white people always wanting 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 but not getting. And that pretty much sums up the entire experience of Western culture. You want this, you want the money, the car, blah, 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 and you're suffering because you're trying to get more stuff. So it's a very succinct impression. <laughs> and he does it very well. It's very excellent when he does it. Very good. Very good. Anywho. Uh, but good, 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 good. We're off to the races. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of juicy stuff there. Um, I realized, yeah, the mic, holding a mic is funny, but as a comedian, for me, it's very natural. Right. So, so when I was getting mics, I'm like, no, I like it. I like holding the mic, and everyone's like, nobody does that. Everyone's got to stand. I'm like, I don't care. I like it, and that's it. Um, so, yeah, a lot of a lot of good stuff there. Interesting that even in the, uh, you know, in the '70s, that must have been a huge topic: uh, freedom versus the man or the system sucking you in. And it, 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 it is so now, but I don't think people are even as aware of it now as maybe back then. You know what I'm saying? Because there was such a huge push for peace and love and getting away from all that. Now it's almost kind of accepted. It's just like, you know what I mean? Get a job, make money. That's just normal. That the system is surviving it and making it in the system is the norm. Well, back then in that generation, getting the fuck out of there 
you know what I'm saying, was was the norm while sort of trying to survive. So it's very, very, very interesting. And this is this is a, a huge topic. Um, huge topic. Huge topic. Um, and so I like to I like to find a, a balance. But what, what would you say? You know, have you met you must have met a lot of people who failed and and kind of went in the spiritual path and they were getting some growth, whatever, and then in the end they just got sucked back in. And that'd be a fascinating thing to talk about. What happened to those people? How did you manage to to kind of pretty much stay out? Because you pretty much for your whole life stayed out of that mainstream machine and did your own thing and had a happy life. So what would you say to the people out there who, and I know this is one of the biggest questions I get all the time, uh, I need money to live, I need these things, how do I How do I go and actually live my truth and be happy and still, and not starve to death, basically? And it's one of the biggest things, I think, out there for people today who are actually waking up. You know what I'm saying? That big dilemma. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean, and uh, sad but true, I've seen a lot of people get as turned on as any of us and, and really see the light, have this enlightenment experience, and then uh, get pulled back in, like the gravity of uh, of fitting in and 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 being in the the kind of I would say the unconscious aspect of the matrix. And, and it, it's like everything. The people that are I don't even know if it's uh, like personally I I'm not sure if it's like a conglomerate that's trying to do it. But but there is a lot of people that want to control us. And I think they got better. Like, we did break the bubble for a while. So I think we actually helped them improve their methods. And then they, they kind of plugged up the holes that led a whole generation. Because it was really a big amount of our generation between, like, 67 and 73. It was wide open. But then I think... A big mistake our generation went from using grass and psychedelics to the hard drugs. I think that was a big uh, way that that whole movement stopped. I, I, I know some people comment on this, but it's not always thought. But that, that was the beginning of the end, in my opinion, when people got overly addicted to trying to get high through ingesting things and the high has to come from within and it was coming for like the music was get you know we were smoking dope of course and periodically tripping but it wasn't like i didn't know a lot of people that were you know taking acid daily it was at the most it was a weekend experience or for the average person or a monthly but acid doesn't get you out of living your dream on the contrary it it typically gets you more on fire about what is the deeper truth so that was a big thing and then i think to answer your question how did i get out i think way before meeting osho osho was a big thing because osho was like I'll, I'll go into that more but because to live in a commune of an enlightened master is is like really you can never go back once you I won't say never because a lot of people that were around Osho went back also but that I'll talk about maybe but for me that little inner pledge I made or inner what do you call it it's more than a commitment it's like a essence promise to myself if my outer work, whatever my outer work of making my living, if it ever gets to the point where I don't have an hour for me, I'm going to change what I'm doing on the outside. And I meant it, and, and I've kept that. And, and I think those people that have that problem, if they look inside when they're getting pulled and sucked into the downward spiral they're not taking an hour a day for themselves where they shut off they either meditate they do something like uh, conscious movements or or they do something with breath work or they do something with uh, you can't keep eating the food that's available in the supermarkets 
You, you know, you can't keep feeding yourself wrongly, not breathing correctly, not moving your skeleton, and not being around people that keep you a little bit on the inspired side of life. Like, I've got such a network of friends that are, their whole thing is how to raise consciousness. And if I was around people like my family, like uh, a lot of friends that I like, if I was just mixing with them, I don't see how I could avoid going down with them. So I, I think the people you're around, the food you eat, the way, did you ever take the time to learn how breathing can transform your body, mind, emotions? You know, people should, should find somebody and take the time to learn about the secrets of the human energy field. And, and that's what me and my partner, Anasha, uh, maybe you'll see her through the window sometime, but, uh, but we dedicated our lives. We've been 35 years together now, and we dedicated our lives. We're going to keep on track. And if I keep myself on track, like my work is with the, in this field, but I think if I did what I'm saying, if I every day took care of myself, then whatever field of enterprise I entered into, I would be successful. And I would almost bet that the majority of people that are in a downward spiral, they're in pain a lot, they're on medication, which you know, you've got to get off medication. You've got to get into your own inner medicine where you don't need to take the pharmaceutical drugs. There's something inside those drugs. He's talking about urine therapy, of course. <laughs> Not exactly. But uh, if you don't get that within the drugs, within the... Uh, food, preservatives, there's a hidden hook that's bringing us way down and it's keeping you from being creative. If you let your creativity, everybody can figure out how to make money here. It's not like, come on, it's not rocket science. Find something that you're good at that you could put energy into and look around and then get some people around you. And And, and I would say... You know, you could almost give me a business and I could make it successful. I, I, I don't want to prove that in real time <laughs> because I really like being independent. But if you said, uh, make sure windows are clean, make sure uh, people get good vegetables, you know, I, I could figure out how to make it profitable. But if I drop that one aspect of every day tuning into me, let, finding that center that I hinted at that I first saw in the Enlightenment Intensive. You know, I, I'm just like everybody. I, I, I get enamored with the outer world and I get thrown off center. But this hour for me that I'm talking about, and I'm not talking about 60 minutes, I'm talking about, you know, a good time where you do connect. You can do it in five minutes once you're good at it. But you have to get good at how do I return to my center that's not involved with my personality, my bank balance, my do I have pain or no pain? There, there's a place that inside a paraplegic where there's no pain. And, and I've seen this happen. I've helped people find that center. And, and so to answer your question, what is the key to not falling into the quicksand it's do some centering devices every day and and there's many there's that's what osho another great thing he kept talking about the 112 methods of meditation that's coming from centuries ago there's 112 different ways to center yourself and, and so he was a master of masters and he talked about each of these, but he said any one of them, if the key is get to your center. So that's what I would say to all your friends and people that uh, get inspired by you. Get inspired, but don't miss the fact you've got to plug in. 
you, you've got to plug into the source. And, and I think when you do that, I, I don't think, I know it. I, I don't know what the... It, it's almost like the psycho-cybernetic people, if, you, if any of you fall, if studied Maxwell Maltz or Napoleon Hill or the great Ogmandino, some of these people, the pioneers of that came before this, uh, what is it, the miracle work and all these, you know, the what are these famous things about how you get what you imagine, whatever. But the pioneers of that, it, it was all working on, it starts from a connection to your source and then you're plugged into the infinite. And that's what I mean, that whatever your interest, whether it's music or any form of business or helping people, there's there's a way to find your niche. Like within the niche of, like you mentioned, body work and uh, massage, it, it's a billion, getting close to trillion dollar business. There, there's so many people I could say, oh, everybody's touching, you know, it's so much competition. Find a niche where Nobody can compete with me. And I would have never known that if I never connected to my source. Not that, I don't know if you're understanding this, but you got to get into a place where I'm not competing with anybody. I'm not comparing myself. I have a, you know, you say you love how I was touched. I have something, but everybody has something that they're really, really unique we're all unique so you just i guess what i'm saying you got to go inside until the trust becomes so clear that magnetically existence comes to me and says i'll help you i'll show you how to do it i I don't know how it works exactly i don't want to be like these new age people that say it's a whole you know, you think, and you you know, I, I don't, but I know there is a link between me trusting, me following my passion, because that's what it's about. Most people, you lose your passion and your health goes down. I could prove this as a doctor, that, you know, it's like the great shaman, that uh, this, the seeker comes in, and he's coming to the shaman for healing. And the shaman just looks at her and says, uh, when did you stop dancing? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and dancing for me is a metaphor. When did you stop enjoying life? When did you start stop uh, having fun? And, and so all of these things, it, it's such a big, like, cosmic network. It's like the fascia of the body. If I talk about the human body, everything is connected. So there's so many little principles that are part of the whole. You, you, you've got to, but I, I think you cannot avoid entering into your unique center on a regular basis. And, and I think in the beginning, you have to make it daily. You can't fool around and say, I'll do a weekend group or I'll listen to this podcast or I'll, you know, go to a yoga class. That's all good, but but you've got to do it alone. You, there is a place, and that's what nobody was telling us. You know, they, they made us dependent on the other and they made us dependent on the outside. I don't even know if there's a they, but it for this, con- it's almost like there is a day. The powers that be made me, uh, they almost castrated me, that I have no power. And, and, and that belief got in me that I need the system, I need insurance, I need uh, a vaccine, I need, you know, I can't stay healthy without 40 vaccines by the time I'm three years old now, you know, my child need and so much rubbish. The The medical profession is the least scientific part of the world that there is, and they somehow made it seem so scientific that everybody buys it, and, and everybody, you know, I, I, to me it's so obvious. You do that, you're going to go down. You, you put your foot in quicksand, there, there's no... 
there's no bottom to it. You're just going to suffer. And so that's kind of my answer. Why did, why do people lose? They lose the trust and they think, oh, okay, I don't want to do this job, but I have to do it. And then they're around people. You know, you can imagine some of the average job sites. You go in and the people, and then you have a boss that's just so himself or herself. They're so screwed up. They're just fucked up. And they're, they're, they're miserable. And, and they've got you right there so they can put their stuff on you. And, and then you've got to, you know, you need the paycheck. So, But I, I think if, if, if you do, if, like wherever you are, you've got to wake up. So let's say you are in such a thing or you're in a relationship that you're not happy, your partner's not happy, and people stay in this. I, I Sometimes I look and I say, but are these people even think, you know, are they conscious of anything? They're spending 12 hours a day with somebody they don't like anymore and that is going in a completely different direction than they want to go. And I say, but who educated your brain you know how did you get that think that's okay so i th i think like the connective tissue everything's connected you've got to keep your body happy and you've got to keep uh, your breath moving you got to keep your mind uh focused on the big picture you've got to keep a sense of humor all these things play into it you you've got to you know you've got to have love in your life you gotta you know move your deep energy you know don't just think about pornography get into sharing get into, your, <laughs> get into your energy you know get, find somebody find somebody that you can really let down all your guards you can let them in you can just just find somebody you can really let down that was a funny place to <laughs> to end the <laughs> no no you got to continue a little more you know you can let down your guard you can you can open up and, and then what's inside of me can pour into them and and that's what uh the great tantra experiences are all about that we empty ourselves in each other and for a few moments the boundaries disappear and then we take that experience into our life and uh, i think it's easy but it's become very difficult to wake up but i i would argue that it's very easy if you do a few fundamental but it, it it's not easy I guess once you're in it, it looks easy. In it, like for me, it's easy. Well, here, here, here's the interesting question. Here's where we're getting juicy now, and I have a bunch of questions already. But um, what would be your definition of waking up? And, and maybe you want to even uh, put that together with another question I had, which is, what is your definition of enlightenment? Okay, these are pretty much. Uh, interconnected ways of thinking but waking up uh, my definition would be be present it, like realize you have three I mean you have more than three but you have three main energies that you want to be present you want your mind to be in the present moment so here we are we're talking I want my body to be here you, you gotta be inside your body you've gotta be inside like i call it three brains you you have a thinking brain but you also have a sensing brain like like my spinal cord let's bring in my friend sure. we got props this episode guys there's props but but you've got a spine that look at these delicate nerves this is what i was talking to you about in front of your sacrum today but uh this is the midline, and this is your brain. And so this is your sensitivity system, feeling. Uh, but isn't this like a musical instrument? Now I'm like a singer playing my guitar. But the body is a musical instrument. Let me just interject that. But, and, and the instrument needs to be tuned. And the more out of tune the body is, problems, pain, uh, small bank balance, many problems happen, uh, bad relations. But if you can keep your musical instrument in a good tune. But anyway, what was I talking about? That uh, 
waking up. Wa three waking up. Okay, yeah. The, the second brain is the sensitivity system, the movement system. And the third brain is the solar plexus heart. So you've got to have your heart be in the moment. You've got to have your emotions like... You know, you, you've got to bring the light of awareness to your mind, your movement, and your emotions. And and until you do that, you're, you're going to be fast asleep, brother. You, you, you just cannot have a mind that's conditioned and not be aware of it and wake up. You have to start seeing the conditioning. Uh, if the body is, is toxic, you, you're going to be sleepy. You're physically sleepy. If you eat wrong, you're just gonna. You're gonna be in a semi stupor. So waking up to me is, I become present. I, I I let my eyes see. I let my ears hear. I try to be in this moment. You know, like right now we're trying to have a nice juicy conversation about a very interesting subject, and I try to keep my three brains in it you know i keep my love of the subject my sadness for the pain that the average person i'm conscious of all of this i don't try to bury the pain of of human reality i, I bring the unconsciousness or the pain to the surface and waking up is is allowing pain to be there and that lets me say another reason the medical profession and the psychology profession is all about numbing the pain. And you cannot wake up if you numb the pain. You can numb the pain for a second, you know, to, to just feel a little bit free of it. But simultaneously, you've got to be making sure that you open uh, the things that can get you out of the pain. You, you cannot rely on... Uh, pharmaceutical drugs you, you just it, uh, to me it's a crime what the doctors are doing what the psychiatric doctors are doing and and if it was if if we started using like consciousness the word is almost it's kind of being used by the mainstream in a way where people forget what it is and people think they're conscious just because they know how to pronounce the word and they can put it into sentences. But you've got to have eyes that see. You've got to have ears that are paying attention. You have to have a mind that's not afraid to say, hey, wait a minute. Do you mean that everybody dying right now is dying because of the coronavirus? These people have been sick for the last 20 years. Now they get a fever and they die and it's the coronavirus. You, you want me to believe that? You really? And to me, if you're awake, you would start saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. And, and so waking up, but waking up kind of can get you in a fight, if you know. Like when I woke up, what the Catholic Church was doing, and I had many of my friends that were abused by priests. A priest tried to come on to me when I was like 16, I... I kind of sloughed him off real quick, but other of my friends, same class, they had a sex situation with a priest, and, and that kind of destroyed their whole mechanism of who to trust. You know, it's not, I'm not against that they had sex, but it, it, it destroyed a whole psychological, uh, uh, a psychological understanding became distorted through that and and a misuse of power so you got to wake up but and then for a while you're pretty pissed off you're saying my god the u.s government my god the doctors my god the priests my god the financial systems my god what do they call these uh, the illuminati you know when you see it wow there is like a looks like a concentrated effort that contained me. And at first, I think you got to get a little bit, like what do they say, the truth will set you free. It's a great saying, but an even better saying, the truth will set you free, but at first it's going to piss you off. It's gonna, But if you live, and, and a lot of people, they live in the protest. And this is where a lot of the, 
you, to answer more your question about what happened to my generation, people got hooked on the protest, and and, and I, I would never go to a protest march. I you know I I don't. The doctors can do what they want. I'm so awake they don't touch me anymore, but I can point out where they're off, but it doesn't affect my hormone system. I don't give them any power. You got to get pissed off and then say, I gave them, I gave away my power to the religions, to the education system, to the medical, to the financial. I gave my power away that I need these people to survive. And so you've got to wake up start becoming awake on the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual level, then you got to get pissed off on all those levels because you were brainwashed by your parents, brainwashed by, you know, and that, if you have, you would say, I don't like that that happened to me. I don't like that you made me tense. You, you basically, your education system made me, taught me how to be tense how to never trust myself, how to compare myself and feel either less or above, how to not be able to uh, love, how to not be able to laugh fully, ashamed to cry. And, and I think you need to get pissed off. That's the great thing of Osho's dynamic meditation. It, it's the best meditation in the world for waking up. But eventually you've got to go to the next step where you take the chain off. And if you're fighting somebody, you're still in the grip of the chain. And you've got to fight a little, you know, just give me space. But I, I don't have to give you the real fight. I just want to learn how to, okay, the medical profession exists, the financial ex- institutions exist but there's a way that I can play within it that doesn't suck my energy and then enlightenment I think we'll have to pause before we talk about that but uh, but it, it's growing if you can keep doing everything I've been talking about the the magnetic pull that your enlightenment will happen starts to be created within you but it has to be created within you so, so far, you know, we're talking about waking up out of the matrix, this reality. You know, certain people control it, and there's the financial system, medical, all, all these things. And a lot of people are completely oblivious to all that. So that's, that's for me, and the way I look at this stuff, that's awakening on the 3D Earth is real, this level. Now, let's look at it on the other level, spiritual enlightenment. What is the difference between Osho and the seekers that are also on the spiritual path? What is Osho... Is it something that he knows? Is it an experience he's had? What is it? What is spiritual enlightenment itself? What, 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 what would you... What, what is your... So that's, so that's the question. What is waking up sp- 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 when it comes to spiritual enlightenment? Okay. Not just out of this right. 3D stuff. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see. And, and this is where all the mystics throughout history, it becomes a little bit difficult to understand just what... The, excuse me, just with the mind. we got to get to a point in all of this where there's a consciousness that's bigger than my mind. And that, I mean, for some of you it may sound pretty crazy, but it's like, who am I without my story? You know, like until I had an experience, I thought who I am is my story. I'm the... I was born here, these are my immediate family, these are my friends, this is what I do, these are my all my memories. I thought that was me. And, and then I had this direct, I think you need dir- a few direct experiences. This is really necessary. And I think, you know, Osho was really uh, kind of the head of the spear. But now through his work, and, and I find it very interesting that, that he said, I'm 50 years ahead of my time. And he said, in 50 years, what I'm talking about now is going to be thought 
very intelligent by a big amount of people. He said, right now, there's very few people that will go with me. What I want, because he was pointing out the religious uh, institute. He was hammering Mother Teresa. Can you imagine that? She's like a sacred cow. And he was saying she's a perfect example of the Catholic Church using poor people and poverty to get more numbers. And, I, and all of us, even me, I was like, say, you're going to go after Mother Teresa now? He went after Mahatma Gandhi. You know, He went after uh, the American government. He, he was just hammering the U.S. government. He was hammering politicians and saying they're all corrupt. He was hammering the vested interest that the money, people are controlling you. And all of us were like, oh, come on, it's not that intense. At first, you're kind of... And then you let it in, and this is part of the awakening part of your question. And you say, okay, yeah, okay, I can see that there are a lot of hooks in religion. There is a political side to religion. They are trying to create guilt in me. And that's disturbing, you know, that I, I kind of liked the Catholic Church as a kid growing up. I kind of had some good moments, you know. You go to the church dances and you have your first uh, little flings. And there was a social aspect of all this stuff that's very beautiful. And so it's hard to see it as poison. But it, 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 I, I would call it like side effects, Within all these things, they're almost like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like there's poison. There's viruses within all these things. And when you start to see it, you first of all, you reject it. Okay, so, and then you clean from the virus. You clean your body. You clean your mind. Like I know you had, uh, you told me uh, one of our friends, Pooja, who works with primal therapy, you clean the 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 trauma from your early childhood you know it's there you can't you can not want to look at it but you can't get around it and uh, so you clean on all these levels all these different frequencies and then what osho was doing that was a little beyond the new age as i see it is he kept talking about no mind there's a place where mind cannot go and, and you cannot get enlightened through your mind. You can have positive experiences. You can become like all the self-help people. You know, they have highly developed minds, but fortunately or unfortunately, I've got to know a lot of these people, and they have more pain. They have more problems with relationships. They have not gotten free. It's very few of the people that have gotten free with their own advice. So Osho, I, like I said, that was one of the byproducts of being with him privately. He had no pain. He was, he got more hate towards him. He, he had an infinite amount of love coming towards him, but he had more hate coming towards him than the average person could ever think of absorbing. He had a lot of people, I don't know if, I'm sure, a lot of people watching aren't aware of how controversial he was and politically. He had the U.S. government. When he tried to stay in Uruguay, the U.S. government didn't, after they threw him out, they didn't want him to settle in Uruguay. So they went to the Uruguayan president and said, that loan that you have to us, it becomes immediately due. And if you don't get rid of this man, and this is all documented. It's not part of Netflix, by the way. But he, the Ecuadorian president, wanted Osho to, to create his commune, to let his vision happen there. Not Ecuador and uh, Uruguay. Uruguay, not Ecuador, Uruguay. And uh, so when the U.S. became aware of that, they came down so hard on Uruguay that they had to, he had to leave when his visa was up. And this is like, so he was, he had a lot of people out to get him. That's what I'm trying to say. And they developed their thallium poisoning with him. It's been done to many people since Osho. I didn't believe it was possible in 1985. I still was programmed to be an American. And, and 
even back when I was young, you know, the Indians were the bad guys. You know what I mean? The, a lot of the stuff that now we've woken up and we've seen, wow, the whole history of America is full of uh, a lot of things that are not rosy. It's not just roses. But it, it was hard for us to handle what we were the bad guys in Vietnam. And that's what my generation was doing. They were saying, no, we're not going to. You're not going to put the lies on us anymore. Remember, they burned banks. Like I had a friend that the Bank of America in Santa Barbara, he went to jail because he helped burn it down. And I think it was like 73 or something. And so we were fighting back. But then to get back on the track of enlightenment, you've got to give up the protest. You've got to surrender. You've got to let go. You've got to expand your thinking mind so much that the boundaries between you and existence disappear and this is not it's scary when when you get to a place that's not your mind you think you're going to dissolve and you can't come back into this matrix anymore you 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 think you're mad when as you kind of have deeper and deeper experiences of uh well, this is exactly what I wanted to get into. Okay. Um, and yeah, you know, I've been, I had my first sort of, uh, you know, awakening samadhi experience right after reading my first spiritual book about 10 years ago. And then I got, you know, I was doing my business and other things and I wasn't hundred, you know, really focused on awakening. The last five years, it's been an obsession with just waking up enlightenment. What is it? Since you Going around. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Since yeah. you came yeah. here, but but I mean, but I mean, like an absolute obsession, and I've had in the last two years, it's gotten very very crazy, and I've had three really crazy experiences. I mean, one one of them was just forty minutes where I just the ego, like the the idea of my personality went out the window, and I, and I just sat there staring, and there was nobody there, and it, I was, it was just presence, and I was like, okay, that was forty minutes, and then after that couple of huge ones that I, I've talked about in the podcast, but literally just the realization of just, I mean, uh, this, the last one was literally the, the ego, just, I went through a death experience where literally I, Sasha died, and I actually thought I died and went to heaven. And I woke up, and the layer, that layer of the fears and all that's, that's associated with believing that this is, this is who we are, all the fear, the separation fear, that was gone. And I woke up and there was only absolute presence, just God, and I was everything, all the trees, the air. I mean, it was all myself, and there was there was absolutely nothing else. And this, I mean, literally, it was beyond, there's no way to ever really explain it. There, there was no, no past, no future, not even a now. There was only everything that is forever, and it's all myself. And I went on for quite some, quite some time. It was fucking crazy. And then it's like, okay, and then the, and then going back into like, slowly, slowly, the mind eventually over time comes back and you start thinking. But for a while, I, it was freaky to wake up and have no thoughts at all. Like literally, you wake up and you're just there, presence, and there's nothing, and there's just bliss. It's freaky. And then eventually, you know, mind comes back and you go back into the world and you have, you start doing things and whatever. So the question is, uh, have you had like what what have been the you know how many like because some people this is what i was going to say because i kind of know you so i've had in the last five years these crazy peak experiences that are just holy fuck and then the mind comes back and i'm still thinking and we're whatever and then eventually you know you level out somewhere higher than you were in terms of peace and but but you're not there at that peak it's an experience you know you have that ultimate truth and then you go down you you're when i see you you're very all the time very chill very present in that state. I I have these peaks, but then you know you see me three months later, and I'm you know I'm running around, and I and I really need to center myself. So to me, you're a master of staying in that space. That that's when I see you. I've never seen you. Oh fuck, I gotta do that. You're always fucking chill, and you're just good. And I'm like, oh yeah, and then <laughs> and I'm just going through these things. So 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 two part question. H- have have you also have you has has your growth spiritual growth been this kind of constant sort of like more of a a steady, you know what I mean, just being more present, more chill? Or have you also had these crazy peak experiences as well? And uh, and just any comment on, on that. And I think there's no there's no right or wrong if we're all different in our in our journey. But uh for me it's 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 just been this fucking crazy shit happening. Oh, yeah. 
Well, first, uh, it's very beautiful what you just shared and very well said. And and I can only say far out and uh, really, really, really beautiful. And uh, I, the word congratulations comes, but it's so trite. But but far out, it's not usual to have that experience, I don't think. It, it should be because... W- now that I turn toward answering, I, I want to start with a very ancient saying that all beings, we're all beings, and, and I, I call us three, be, three brain beings, but we're a being. All beings are from the very beginning Buddhas. We all are enlightened. We come from the stuff, and this is a very ancient thing that I think when you were in that experience you wouldn't you would have said that that's true i'm enlightened but everything is enlightened everything M- more than that there's a there's a few things that after that you, you you know you just you just know because in that state any question i had was immediately answered because i was the one giving the question and the one posing it because i was all of it and so what i realized what it's not even i realized there was no sasha there it was just there was there was, there was just everything is and i'm that and and it's it's there is everything is that so whether you call it god consciousness presence that is all that there is and it's everything and it's permanent and it's forever and it's never ending it's just all that is and that's what we are we're all that is and it the mind can't comprehend it because we're so used to this perspective this body this person but we're not we're not any of that we're everything and after that after that it's like when i talk about myself like I'm lying when I when I in a conversation say myself and I'm talking about this because myself is all of it and I can never not know that that's just what it is but the other thing is everyone is god regardless of their belief system or what they think you can go around saying no I'm an agnostic it makes no difference what you or I or anyone believes everyone is that of which I speak regardless of their opinion and that's a hell of a thing. So after that, I, 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 I was always really eager before to always, oh, I had this experience or that. that I have nothing to, to force on or tell anybody because everybody is myself. And everyone is God. And, 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 it, and, and the, so the other thing that just I know is that everyone will go through that. Everyone will attain absolute realization because that is the nature of consciousness. Consciousness keeps going to higher and higher states until you get back to the absolute. And so whether it takes people... Uh, 20 lifetimes or a thousand it makes no difference enlightenment is your destiny and that's a trip there's there's no need to rush anyone you're going to wake up the question is when how soon this lifetime next lifetime or do you want to suffer for another thousand before you before you wake up but everybody is going to get there because that's the nature of god is 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 returning to god it's a trip it's really beautiful and so the man who said all beings are Buddhas is uh, a Zen master. And Zen has a great saying. Uh, there was a story that on the front it says, I am in a hurry. And on the back it says, I am not a, in a hurry. And so you bring up the thing of urgency. It is going to happen. All the rivers reach to the ocean. But I would say... If you care, if you're present, why wallow in suffering if you know you can get to the ocean? You know, why keep in the mud on the bank of the river? Get in the center of the river. And that's what waking up is, I think, getting in the river. And then it, it, it's out of your hands. Some of the, I, I don't know how that experience you describe happened, but probably when you least expected it. You didn't make it happen. You didn't generate it. it you, you kind of prepared the ground. And, and often Osho and other great mystics, and even Jesus talks about grace. There, there's something with enlightenment that's grace. It is going to happen. And uh, by the way, thank you for complimenting on how you see me. But that I'm always chilled. and And I do have peak experiences and go down but it is true if it was a graph it looks much different than it did and in zen 
they they have a word they have a word for this experience when when you had that aha waking up they call it satori and and many times you have a satori that and and we would get it with the help of psychedelics like i think anybody who's done a psychedelic trip they have a a satori and that they see wow i'm part of nature i'm part my whole past doesn't mean anything only now means any you know it's like a deep experience of now 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 and that's what i mean how to when i answered how to wake up you come into the now with your senses with your thoughts with your body with your energy but uh so then zen also has you keep you need these satori's it it's almost like it becomes a food for this for this being like worth were multiple layers of being like my mental being i can become very intelligent very smart i can sharpen that i can become a great dancer or you know i can sharpen my become a great athlete i can become a great singer or poet or entertainer through my emotional body you know it takes an emotional opening but uh for enlightenment it it it's like food all these satori's feed you and it keeps you yes 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 and then they have an expression it's called samadhi it, it's just permanent and it sounds like you're kind of vacillating between permanence and impermanence still but but you're kind of tip the scale that even when you're kind of in your down you're not really freaked out like you used to be you're just kind of well this is curious i'm negative i'm against everything i don't feel good but then there's a part of you watching that there's a part of you that's aware of that you're not hooked by it the same way i would guess anyway no no every every things are quite quite different now it's like i'm, I'm there's always an underlying piece like i don't really i don't oh yeah i don't i don't get pulled into pulled into but stuff I there's still a mind but it's not going oh i'm afraid you know the feet the, the, so the that yeah. underlying chill factor is what you see me kind of when you look at me but you don't see those moments when i am but when i'm really high i'm not really out of center either anymore like i used to, i used to get high or be blissed out or you know my team wins and you know i'm like gone but even even the highs are it's a little bit different and and people would almost you get afraid because you say oh then it's not so juicy or salty is life becomes just that's what also there's a point what life is just bliss even that doesn't seem so juicy you know so but i i think it sounds like you're doing great and that that and i think that happens to everybody when you develop your presence like that means be a witness of your body be a witness of your your joy of your sadness of your anger of your jealousies all these subconscious of your envy like these are poisons man and if you don't see and it's so normal for americans or western people like you made that joke the indian you know the the white people uh it's so normal that i would compare myself to you i would if you have a podcast it and and you have more followers you know just so many things you have more people more people look at you and smile at you down you know we're always compare we've been trained to compare and we've been trained to be envious and you've got to get to the root of that and pull it out of you that, that's all that's all that's all the ego again one 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 of the things um that just again that you just i, I now know we're all uh we're all god but we're all as all as souls we're all very very unique and so we're all we all have our place and we're there's no one to compete with at all because there's only one 
you ever. So the only thing you really need to be doing is living your truth, alignment with the soul and being who you are and bringing your unique gifts to the world. So when people ask me, well, Sasha, how do you want to improve your life? It's always getting even more into alignment, doing just the things that I find the most exciting and that give me the most gratification. Not things I like 80%. I want to be doing things I like 100% like this. This is part. This is my joy, getting up on stage, telling jokes, working with with men, doing events, all these kind of things that I do, that stuff. But when someone, oh, do you want to do this? Or this? If it's like, ah, oh, yeah, that's kind of like, no. That's that. That's the thing. So when you, when, you, when you exit the competitive bullshit that we're trained into, my God, that's when life begins because there's, there's no one to compete with. Right. And on the, on the ultimate, everyone your, is yourself. Who are you competing with? There, it's all you. There's no one else but here. There's only one being in all of existence, and it is I am, and it is all of us. It's everything. Um, now, here's the dichotomy. Here, here, here's where it gets interesting. Um, in the ultimate, and again, it's it's almost like I can say it, and it, and I'm not in that state now. But in the ultimate, everything is absolutely perfect. The planet is perfect. All the atrocity, all the fuck, it's all absolutely perfect because it's all myself. And the planet is the perfect school for, for awakening. And literally in that, I realized the absolute perfection of all of existence. No problems, no worries, nothing to change. But then now I'm back in the body and you hear about these horrible things. You know, the, the, the financial system, they're taking billions of dollars. People are struggling to eat. As a human, I'm like, hey, fuck this. You know, we got to stop this shit. But when I go back to that, there's nothing to stop. It's all a dream. It's God having a dream. So it's this, they're both true. Within the dream, fucked up shit is happening. But ultimately, it's a dream. What's the difference? Right. <laughs> it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a fuck around. It's actually beautiful. And it, it's... Uh that energy, like we're immaterial and we're material. And, and this consciousness is immaterial. Everything you're saying, everything is perfect. And, and it's not really perfect how things happen on the outside. And that's why it's kind of, there's a great, also it's an Eastern word, Leela. It, it's God's play. And, and somehow, I don't know why, I can't explain it, but this polarity and this dance of polarities, like like it or not, you re-enter your body after that experience you described. And you re-enter, and like it or not, after I saw I'm more than my personality, I'm back in on a Buddhist personality. And I'm interfacing with the world that people do remember who I am, and they do have an opinion about me, and they do have judgments, and I have my own opinions about situations and how to navigate that. But I think when you combine both, when you, you're kind of moving through the banks of material, immaterial, it, it's at the least you would say it's very interesting. But at the best, you have infinite possibilities. You, you're in the world of... Inf and within the pain and the suffering and the the really fucked upness of the, of reality there's really joy and there's beauty there's love so it, it's quite it's that's what i said it's pretty difficult to talk about but it's it's fun to live it and 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 that's why we we got to get angry and fight it and try to improve it but we can't get stuck there. We got to see. Sometimes you got to see. But it is perfect. If if the planet needs to die, if if the coronavirus has to take out 15 million people in the next few months, which I have my doubts. But but all these things, you. But don't let that get you so distracted you lose your own center. But see it, and then okay, where could I help? Like I know with the work we're doing with Arun Medicine Buddha. We're helping lots of people become their own doctor. So that's my way, like teach you how can you be your own medicine Buddha. You can heal the physical, you can raise your consciousness, but I can't take down the powers that be. I'm not going to get a Merrick or Bayer aspirin to stop doing what they're doing or the Coca-Cola industry to stop doing what they're doing. I, I'm not going to... And if I try to bring them down, I'm going to get killed, you know. So I got to pick my battles. And I would uh, advise all your your people, your friends, pick your battles and, and choose battles that raise your own consciousness. 
like I'm choosing the battle, everybody's in pain. Okay, so I'm going to, in the people in my immediate sphere, starting with me, is it possible to live without pain? I've answered the question for myself, yes. Can you disidentify, can you avoid pain? No, nobody can avoid pain. Nobody, even the enlightened ones. Osho, one great quote he, he said to me, he, he was saying, on a Buddha, people have a misunderstanding about the man of awareness. They think that if you're aware, you don't feel pain. And he said, and actually, it's the opposite. When you're aware, you feel the pain more. The suffering of others, you feel it more. But when you're aware, you're not identified. And the other people that feel the pain, they feel this, they're identified with it. And the enlightened person moves beyond identification of good and bad. And that, when I heard that something in me, because my whole life, I, I, my name means love and awareness. And so the word awareness, I, I want to be aware. You know, I, I want to be aware of what's going on outside, inside. And, and, and he used that expression, the man of awareness. The man of awareness thinks they won't feel pain. It's not true. They will, but if they're really aware, they will not be affected by it in the way that people are affected. Pain will become an alchemical energy. It, it won't be pain that's bad. You've gone, you know, even the word pain, it looks like it's bad, right? It, pain doesn't have any aspect of that word that you think, oh, that's good. But for me, it does. Because pain is going to focus my awareness. And if I have a physical pain in my liver, that's my liver's way of saying, Anabuddha, look at me. Come here. It can't do anything else. Or my neck's in pain, or my low back hurts, or, you know, whatever, a headache. It's just saying, Buddha, bring your awareness here and clean it clean it so for me pain it's like saying it's like a little buzzer this buzzer is going to go off soon that uh hey it's time for me tune into me so pain is like okay in my in my paradigm it, it's not a bad thing because i have got beyond the polarity and that's a pretty good place to be yeah, this will be the first episode also with a with a with a spine spinal column in it. <laughs> hey, do you guys see that episode with a spinal column? We did. That was a good one. It was nice. Um so lots of fantastic stuff there. Um yeah, the pain thing yeah, I, I, I don't I don't I don't yeah, it's a big subject and I, I've noticed that as well. I don't have the same relationship with it anymore because it, there's 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 fear that comes with pain. And when you know you're really not the body then it's a, you know it, it's you, it, it's obviously the the symbol and a signal, but you just I just don't freak out in the same way. Comment on that. I, I just want to comment on that. That uh, that's what happened with that really strong. Like there's mild satori's and they're big satori's. You had a very big one, and what it does it's it's like a near death experience. It was a death. I actually literally died, d died and I was so convinced that I died. I thought I'm leaving the body, right. and then I woke up. So there's very many, this is a great, if you ever want to Google something, interest, Google the experiences of people that had near death. And all of them report something similar, that they're not afraid of life anymore. Because if you're afraid of, li of death, you cannot live totally. So you had an experience that you, death was actually great. It, it wasn't a problem. And that's another of the biggest fictions that Osho erased. He, he even has a book called Death is the Greatest Fiction. And it's really amazing. So then you touch, the reason I grabbed the mic is the other thing we haven't used that word, but fear. And that's what all the outer matrixes are doing. They're injecting fear. That's what the coronavirus is. The worst thing about it is that people are getting more afraid. And fear, it takes you into a controllability and it takes you into a shrinking that, that's, that it's pure poison. So anyway, I, I just wanted to, I keyed off that word fear and you went beyond fear. You're not afraid of death. Like, you know, if, if I'm gonna say I'm gonna shoot you today, you might 
think, okay, wait a minute. But in general, there's a deep understanding that you're not afraid of death. Again, one of the things you, I just kind of know now is that the only death that is real, that exists, is the death of the ego. That's the only one. Actual death is impossible because all of us are consciousness itself. We are all that is. And then I still have an ego, and the question becomes, how can I use my ego instead of my ego using me? And that's what you're doing. You have a, a gift for humor. You have a gift for... Uh, sharing information that can help people wake up and and so you need your personality your ego in that sense like the word ego is not all bad brother and and so now you know how to dance you, you you're in the lila it, life becomes a play of energy it's god's play and that's what that word means and and so now that you've seen god in everything you are god playing you are god the, the, so yeah so ego is just it's it's there's multiple layers. This is what me and my spiritual teacher are kind of figuring out. There's multiple layers. And as long as you're separate from God, like all that is, you have an ego. But it's the it's it, but it's separation. And there's a layer of the ego that's separation based where all this fear comes in. You know, I'm different than you, so you could hurt me, or you could fire me from my job and I'll starve to death, or you could stab me, or you could break my heart. All that or you could take my girlfriend. Or you could steal my girlfriend. So so what happened when I went through the death, it was certain layers of fears, separation fears, they died. And I woke up with without the, without those and for a while without even the the, the, the idea of Sasha. You know, it, it, you know, and it's really waking up out of out of the nightmare that I believed I was a person and that I was limited, that I could be hurt, that I could die. That all just went out the window. Um, so it's a trip. One thing I I like to do is uh, I love words, and and we almost need a new word. Uh, what is that part of the Sasha being that he's using his ego? But the word ego doesn't work anymore because you've gone, you've seen through the trap of the ego now you're using your energy field in a new way so we need a new word a lot of the vocabulary doesn't fit for these deeper experiences of consciousness beautiful yeah part of me feels like almost like i i, I need to find a new name because like sasha died yeah. uh, like honestly that, i'm not that guy anymore that's what osho is about and that's why he gave us all a new name he, he said there comes a moment where you need a new name and and you need the, it's a rebirth and in many great mystics including osho not i said osho i was thinking jesus he until you die you, you cannot be with my father you have to die to be reborn and and that was the outer form of taking a new name and, and so i 43 years ago i 44 years ago my name became anabuddha prem anabuddha and and there is a before and after and there is a and i can use my other name if i you know i'm fine with it but but yeah you need a new name i agree yeah so i'll uh, i'll contemplate on that well this has been Epic. I know we're going to have a round two because I've got some great questions uh, that just must be answered but another time. But get, for the people who are uh, interested in you and, and what you do and are interested in maybe meeting you or, or working with you, give the people a little bit about like what is it exactly that you're offering and where can they find you uh, in cyberspace, cyberspace and where in the world will you be in 2020? 2020, it feels like such a good year, but... By the way, it feels like a real... I, I think we've hit a critical mass of awakening, and I'm very encouraged. But anyway, uh, for 40 years, my whole work has been with the human energy field, uh, with the body, and uh, I never stopped loving it. Around Osho, I created many of the most famous... Uh, body-oriented therapies around Osho with his guidance, his direct guidance. And Anasha was part of that too. And for the last 26 years, we started something we call a Rune Conscious Touch. It's, uh, it's a beautiful training. I, I recommend it to everybody that for two weeks, devote two weeks of your life to understanding the phenomena of human touch and we touch not only with our hands 
we touch with our eyes, we touch with our voice, we touch food touches, air touches, life moves through touch. Basically, in short, I would say we are touching beings. Every moment, everything moves through touch. And within the practical part of Arun conscious touch, we teach the whole spectrum of off the body touches, ultra light. We teach people how to move the body, how to adjust the spine, how to create freedom where there's stuckness. And all of the touch, we show people how to touch deep. We focus on all the main, the five centers of the body, the, the pelvic center, the belly center, the chest center, the throat, and the head. So in the two weeks, it's kind of done so, if you don't mind me saying, it's so well thought out how to weave in mathematics of the body, the music of the body, which is really everybody has to experience the music of the human body, and then the meditation of the body. Yeah, I'm not used to a mic like this. But those three M's, and we really give it an experience. In in this year, we have two really... We just finished a great two weeks here in Vilcabamba. We'll do it again next January, too. But uh, the next trainings we have are in Germany. And one is full, I know, so I won't talk about that. But in, in the Munich area, there's a four-day group that should be beautiful. It's right by Kimsey and... Uh, in the Munich area, it's a beautiful lake. And then our big, we have a, a the beginning of a two-year training that we start in Portugal. That's in June, and then we have a beautiful. Uh, if you're in the I- Italy area, with a, one of the great musicians from Osho, Deva Kant, who is worth googling his work if you like uh, meditative shamanistic music. Uh, Deva Kant, but we're doing a beautiful group in Italy with him. But that's again, it's only four days. Our longest group is two weeks in Spain, and that's what I highly recommend people if you want a deep cleaning of everything we talked about is is, is addressed in in this two weeks. And it's fun. It's uh, juicy. It's uh, Anasha is an amazing person. Maybe on part two we'll bring her into the action. Uh, but she's from France. And and of all the people that have meditated with the human breath, I think she's gone deepest into it in the last 45 years. And we talk a lot about how to eat right. It's, it's the medicine Buddha. We teach people... Uh, Physically, how to heal from all diseases, but then uh, conscious-wise, that's the Buddha part. And uh, we can be reached very easy. It's uh, www.buddha.live, and that's our website. Uh, we're on Facebook through Anabuddha Lee. Uh, that's me. And, uh, yeah, we're easy to get in touch with. And, and we like to interact with people. We like to... Uh, Cyberspace, I call it the Ethernet. It's it's that place we're all connected in this day and age. We we have a really beautiful uh, twenty hour video program you can get. It's about self touch, self massage. I didn't mention that, but but to me, touching yourself is the highest form of of human touch. And and I go into great detail in this, and, and this you can see on our website. But that's kind of what 2020... Then we're going to be in America. We're going to be in San Diego, L.A. area in October. We're going to be in Dallas in uh, in uh, November. If you want to do something with us in Asia, we'll be in Japan in uh, late October. So 2020, we got a lot on our plate, you know. We're still, you know, at that age where we love to share, you know, and I don't know when it's going to stop, but I, I love to, to share and help people learn about human touch. I, I think it's something everybody 
should be very comfortable with their own touch and and know how to access healing through touch. I, I think it it should be part of every education system. So I love it. And so, yeah, connect with this if you like. Yeah, I just want to say, um, for me, one, one of the ways I, I used to be, you know, I couldn't speak to women. That was why I... I got into my whole career and the way the way I actually was able to connect was I was always good with my hands I used to play the yeah, piano as a good, as a kid so that was actually a way I used to get you know oh you you look like you need a yeah I'll give you and, and then because women would realize I was good with my hands there was a connection there and I, they'd end up talking to me and I'd get chicks so actually uh, for me it's been quite a <laughs> profound part of my life come on guys foreplay it's important and there's nothing that's what touch is that's what your eyes are you learn to touch without judging you're with this woman or this man and you're not judging them you're finding the essence within this touch and and once you can see the essence and the consciousness in everybody i I tell you sex is no longer sex it's so much better than that word sex is is so small compared to what can happen when all the centers are participating in in the merger and uh, it is true that touching another person there you must have seen on youtube some great videos of babies that weren't touched and then they start to be touched and they go from shrinking to expanding there the human touch and that's why we that's why we call it a rune conscious touch the touch is the love, like that's another word for love, and and it it's connecting, and consciousness is meditation. It's the Buddha. It's the being, and so when you have both of those, my God, I don't see how any man or woman would resist you. Why would they resist that? Plus, with this face, come on, <laughs> beautiful. So, for all you beings out there, so if you're uh, on YouTube, I will put the link below to Anna Buddha's website. And uh, do join our mailing list because uh, I'll be also doing some other interesting things around the world. And once every blue moon, I will email people and let them know. And uh, and I believe there'll be some bonuses on the YouTube channel as well, little extra bits that weren't on the podcast. So thanks for tuning in. I love you all. Love yourselves. Be good to yourselves. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Say bye. Bye. See you soon. Ciao.